All right, well, thank you for showing up. Um, so I decided I changed the, this class just to doing some very quick recap, uh, last hints, and then I was basically gonna have questions if you had them. There's only a few of you though, so this will take much shorter period of time than I anticipated. So this might be like a 15 minute class, we'll see. Um, so basically the final version as said by 2015 would be updated, so those are up now. There's no real changes from the previous draft. Um, the main difference was that the course is still not finished, as you can see, so most of the stuff is up there. Uh, I haven't updated the actual figure. Um, basically the course they built should be close to that figure. If you want specific dimensions, just measure them off the course. That's sort of the best way to go at this point, uh, which you probably already knew. Um, as before, I had mentioned show up uh, in Sexton at 9 a.m. ready to go, uh, and you'll be told what the next set of matches is. So this is all the same stuff for Monday. Uh, there's been no changes there. Um, what else changed? It's still the same double elimination. Uh, do two losses, you're knocked out. Uh, so basically, all of this, the only things that really changed in the final is a few additional clarifications. Um, the batteries were updated, so you have 10 batteries uh, instead of, I think the rules it said six for some reason, that was a mistake. Uh, basically, as many battery holders as you have in the kit, you can use. Um, it also clarified that you can use an extra wire. Uh, I think the rules at one point said that, but then somewhere else seemed like they said, oh, you shouldn't use anything else. Uh, but you like hook up wire, I think resistors and capacitors were all listed as things you could um, use any amount you want of. So that was clarified. Um, as before, I said, Mark's, they're still building these trigger boards, so they should be ready. Um, so this will be triggering your robot, basically this small device. And if you want to check, he does have at least one of them to physically uh, insert into your robot. Um, and again, we have the, the plus five volts. Uh, goes, you have to connect the ground, you'll have to connect somewhere, um, and then the reset. We'll go to your AVR reset pin. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the reset on the board in a second. Uh, as before, yeah, I said you must provide space. So this is all the same as Monday. Uh, lunch, so yeah, there is the barbecue on that day. Uh, there also should be snacks and drinks for you, so to keep you hydrated, uh, they'll have water at the competition day and stuff like that, so don't worry about that. Um, yeah, so a few issues that I had seen in the labs. One of them is that on the, the motor driver boards, uh, there's a little LED, and this sort of LED uh, indicates, I, I mentioned this before, this under voltage condition. Um, and people were having it sort of flash on and off. So this means you don't have enough power going to that driver board. Um, and often what it was is that you had the motor driver board and you know you had something like uh, a breadboard and if you were taking power, uh, if these are the, the rails and the breadboard, um, you know you have power going into one side of the breadboard and going through all of the breadboard. Uh, connections to the motor, it adds a lot of resistance. Uh, it's much, much better to instead just take the motor uh, straight. So if you had your breadboard here, and we have those same power rails, uh, it's a much better idea to wire the motor itself. So if this is our batteries here, AA batteries, I lost my swear. Forgot my stylus, sorry, so it's a lot crappier diagrams than usual. Um, but anyway, so if you take the, you know, or this is the motor driver board, not the motor, but uh, take your wires from the motor driver board and wire them right to the battery, right to the switch. So this is a lot better. And then have another pair of wires that goes off to your logic board. Um, so this way you don't have all the resistance associated with the the breadboard connections, which aren't great for high current. Um, the problem is that that resistance will cause voltage drop, so that causes your motor driver to, uh, to drop out. Uh, another thing you might see, I don't think anyone's seen this explicitly, but on your board, let me pull up a photo here. Um, one of these labs, I think, Yeah, 
Yeah, so on your uh, AV airboard, you can't quite see it. Or maybe you can. There's a pin here labeled reset. Um, so this pin that's labeled reset is going to be what that, uh, that special board plugs into to trigger the start. Oops, come on. I'll just plop this down. Uh, is what you, the, your board is going to plug into to trigger the start of the, um, the robot. So what you can do to improve uh, reliability is if you connect a pull-up resistor on this reset pin, something like a 10K uh, resistor, and you go to the 5 volts, and it needs to be fairly big because that board needs to be able to pull this, this pin down. Um, so you don't want like to wire this directly. You want a highish value resistor. Um, so if you use a 10K resistor, it's going to force that reset pin to be uh, at the non-reset state. Um, where this might get into issues is if, as your motors turn on and stuff like that, it generates a bit of an uh, EMI, electromagnetic interference, uh, that can couple into this reset pin and actually reset your AVR. So you would have seen this running most likely, although it could be sort of an uncommon fault where your code seems to start back at the beginning. Um, so you might want to consider adding that sort of uh, pull up to your reset pin just to prevent this. That's very common on um, the AVR in circuits you'll see is they'll have that sort of uh, resistor on the reset pin and often a capacitor as well. Uh, the objective of the capacitor which would go to ground, so if I then oops, connected a capacitor and you know I'd have to go off to wherever my ground is. Uh, and so this is to filter out sort of transients as well, uh, so that you don't have a very quick spike goes into the reset pen or anything like that. Uh, speaking of motor EMI, so this is something that actually had been mentioned in the driving DC motors slides, I believe. Uh, and in the lab, at least, you played a bit around with, let's see if I can... Uh, we played around a bit with, you know, adding a diode, which your motor driver will have, so this was for killing off the inductive kick, um, but we also played around with a capacitor for noise suppression, and you could see still, so this is with a diode, with the motor running, uh, you see these really big spikes to, you know, minus 4 volts and plus 16. Um, and by adding a capacitor across the terminals, um, these spikes basically went away entirely. So this is something that when you're running the motors, you might see you know, weird stuff happen. Sensors reset, sensors give incorrect values. And it might be because your, um, your power supply is so dirty, made so dirty by these motors that the, uh, the out of range voltages are giving you issues. So the easiest way to solve that is adding a capacitor across the motor. So the most basic is just um, just this guy here, and that could be like their 100 nanofarad ca caps you have a whole bunch of um, across the motor. Uh, you can also add one from the, the positive and negative soldered right to the motor case, so depending how much access you have to the outside of the motor. Um, so this is sort of, you know, an example someone did of how you would do that. So you can see the one capacitor soldered right across the terminals, and you want it to be right on the motor, physically on the motor. You don't want this to be added to your breadboard or on the driver terminals um, because you're trying to provide through the capacitor a very short path. So if currents are generated here, um, you're providing a very short loop so there's not a lot of space to radiate out uh, the interference. If you, you, know, you had long wires and your capacitor there, the problem is that um, any transients are now going to be flowing through this huge loop, uh, which has a lot more physical area, which means it can radiate a uh, larger uh, field and therefore affect your electronics, and it'll bring it closer to the electronics you're trying to protect. Uh, you also see, so there's a capacitor here going to the case. So this terminal is just the motor, physical motor case here. Um, you have to be careful doing this, that if you have to solder to the case, that you don't heat it up too much and melt something. Uh, I don't know, because I know the motors are sort of built into the gear system. Uh, so you may or may not want to do this, depending on which axis you have. But at minimum, adding the capacitor across the terminals is probably going to help a lot with um, 
any EMI problems you might run into. All right, so that's sort of some of the basic hints of stuff that I saw people had troubles with that uh, might improve your results. I also want to emphasize again um, that we're getting, you know, we're at a week away, well, we are a week away from the competition day. Uh, and remember that the competition mark is 15% of the grade. Um, your final report is worth more than that. So even if you don't do well in the competition, um, it's worth quite a bit describing technically how your robot should work, you know, what it's done, uh, the update of your scheduling, sort of everything that was mentioned uh, in the original course description of what should be included in that final report. Uh, and just to remind you, open what that's supposed to be. Uh, and so these finals, the description I believe is in the final rules here. Oops. Everything's cloud-based now, so. Okay, there we go. Uh, so the final report, again, this shows what uh, stuff you have to contain. So again, we have the uh, executive summary, um, sort of an introduction, talking a very, and this can be fairly brief, but you know, period covered, phases. Um, the discussion, so this is sort of the most uh, critical part. Um, so to, this is showing work you've completed uh, since your, your initial progress report. Um, any issues you've come up with, you know, like, oh, this is why we weren't able to get certain things working. Um, this part, you know, part of it you can't do till the competition itself, but the success or lack of success, so talking about what you might do differently in the robot competition. Um, and overall, if you're doing the whole design again, what might you do? So uh, would you, you know, decide, hey, we spent too long on one sensor, we dedicated too much time to some area, we'd spend, you know, more time uh, making the design more robust, something like that. Um, yeah, and then sort of a quick evaluation of the progress. So you had a schedule originally, and you'll see how well you did for that, um, and a quick statement. So the final report it can be longer than the progress report, sort of the seven to 10 page, and you can add as many appendices uh, as you wish, basically. Again, you don't have to. The appendices are designed to back up uh, any statements you make. Within that, so your source code, for example, should be in the appendix, at least the main uh, section of your source code. Um, if you're using uh, any of the open source projects or the projects people have posted, you have to make sure you include a, a note of that uh, somewhere in the report. Of course, you're allowed to use them, but you have to mention that. Uh, and any, if you use examples pulled from the web from someone else, you have to mention that in the, um, the final report. So the marking, the marking scheme will be similar to the, or the same basically as the progress report. Uh, so this is just written as out of 100. Um, but there's a, uh, oops. Oh, come on. Okay, there we go. Um, so, you know, the short executive summaries, uh, basically, you get marks, do you have the scheduling tools? Do they look reasonable? Um, so if you're using a Gantt chart, which is probably the easiest way to convey this, is it, you know, does it have more than four items? So if you just have like design robot, build robot, do robot, that's not a great schedule. Uh, or you can choose a work breakdown structure with some time. Uh, you know, and is it reasonable? Can I read the, the description? So that's sort of the, the Gantt chart. Um, there's a should be that short discussion on the schedule, you know, not a huge, huge discussion. Um, the introductory content, so you can see this sort of maps to what's required in the uh, in the rules. Um, the majority of the marks are for what I'm calling technical content. So this is, you know, talking about issues you had, uh, talking about specifics of your design, talking about uh, technical problems you encountered. Um, anything like that. So all of the, the technical side, this should, you know, your report obviously has to include a, a reasonable amount of technical content so it can understand 
uh, how your robot works, you know, the design choices you've made, specifics of the code, stuff like that. Um, finally, there's the uh, problem solving, problem discussion. So this ties in a little bit to the technical stuff, but this is more specifically calling out, you know, did you mention a few problems uh, you ran into? How did you solve them? They don't necessarily even have to be technical problems. Uh, just any sort of problem you solve. You know, one of my members was hit by a bus and it's like, well, what do I do now? Uh, so that's a problem you need to solve. Uh, and finally, there's some marks obviously for presentation formatting uh, and to some degree English usage. So I'm not enforcing strict grammar rules or strict referencing or anything like that. Uh, but you know, it should be reasonably legible or legible. Um, formatting should be reasonable. Again, I don't have a very specific uh, rules beyond what was written in the um, in the contest guidelines, but that's sort of how the final report will be marked, just so you're aware of it. Um, are there questions on that marking? If not, I'll go back. Uh, yeah, so talking about the backup plan, so as I said, remember that the, the final report uh, and the presentation is worth a fair amount. Uh, at some point too, you should really have a drop dead date, I'll call it. So you still do have a week, uh, so you have some time to prepare, but you should choose a time uh, when, you know, it's like we have this really fancy ideas, they're not working. What's a really simple backup plan? And you might even want to start, have someone working on that. Um, you know, so this would be basically dead reckoning the robot around. So we just drive for three seconds this way, churn for 0.5 seconds, drive for eight seconds this way, spin for 0.5 and drive and stop. Uh, you know, and 10% of the time we hit a bunch of coins and the final flag, but 90% of the time we hit a few coins at least. Um, so it is worth to have that plan in place. And if things aren't working, uh, you can switch to it. This is, so in my experience too, having this simple backup plan is very, very useful for competition day. Um, what might happen is, you know, something will go wrong with your robot. Uh, for example, you know, one of your sensors breaks and you don't have time to fix it. One of your circuits starts behaving odd. You don't have time to troubleshoot, you know, why is this circuit not working in the gym? Uh, if you already have some really basic, very, it doesn't have to be complicated at all. Um, you know, that at least let your robot move and get four points. Uh, it's gonna be someone that, you know, now because their sensor broke, the robot can't move at all. Uh, so I really recommend playing around with a plan B, both for uh, timing and for the day of event to make sure that if everything goes wrong, you have something you can program in your controller. You know, it doesn't use any of your sensors maybe, but it can still do something um, and possibly still get you some points. Uh, so this is just an, an additional note on sort of the, the status of the course relative to the plan. So this is the original plan and this is what's in the, the final version. Um, so the original plan, most of this stuff will be up. So uh, you can see, for example, this gate is up now. Um, the, the fixed objects here have been up for a while. Where are they? Here they are. Uh, and here they are. Uh, the, the tunnel has been up. As a note, th this diagram had a tiny bit of an error. Uh, the tunnel is sort of one side's wider than the other, you can see. So this side's wider, which wasn't supposed to be. So when they built the course, they made it an even distance. Uh, otherwise, your robot almost couldn't fit through the bottom part. Um, but I kept the drawing as is. Uh, these metal strips but were just added, so they weren't there yet. If you were playing, they were just added the other night. Um, so I think they're all there now. Uh, the only thing that's really unsure build status is there's a moving obstacle here, sort of vaguely in that area that moves back and forth. Uh, I don't know for sure that's going to end up being built in time. I have no way of knowing yet. Uh, it looks like they will, but in case you know they need to fix a whole bunch of other stuff, they won't have time to do that. So don't. You know, it doesn't really hurt anyone if it's not there, you do better probably, uh, but be aware that that is something that may change. Uh, everything else should be the same. So the flag, the flag in the middle um, is still good and these buttons I'm hoping are mounted today or tomorrow. 
Uh, I know they're basically done at this point. Um, and the moving ob uh, the knockable objects will be added, you know, during hopefully before the competition day, but they'll be there. They're just walls, so you can really easily uh, emulate those if you want um, and see where they'll be. Uh, the right now these pits have foam in them, so I got them to put foam so that if you fall into the pit, your robot shouldn't be hurt too badly or anything. Uh, I don't know for sure. They might take that off on competition day, they said. So, so you really want to avoid the pits. Uh, you know, even if you have a backup plan to just drive straight, uh, you might want to try to drive straight and then stop after a certain time rather than uh, relying on the pit to stop you. Um, so I think that's about all of the features of this. And uh, double check if you're relying on the location of the coins. I know they moved a few of the coins over, so I think these coins got <laughs> shifted. Right now they're split sort of between two of the plywood sheets. Uh, so I think they shifted these to be like here and here and no coins there. So there were some minor adjustments in the final version. Um, but again, verify from the, uh, the physical course, not from this diagram. Uh, yes, that is, yeah, and that was one of, almost the only real update to the final version of the rules that's updated, that's online now, um, is to say that the final course as built is the competition surface that we intended. Uh, so this is to account for the fact that the, the movable object may or may not end up being ready. Uh, I'm still hopeful it is, but just be aware of that. Everything else should be the same. Um, so with that, I'll kind of ask, is there questions or is there stuff people have had trouble with their robots that I can help with? Everything's working amazingly? Or not at all? <laughs> no one's in between. Uh, well, my group has been having an issue with the wheel encoders where like, we get it to give us feedback and tell us when the wheels are spinning and we try to match the speed to that. And we always still get one wheel moving slightly faster, substantially faster than the other. So not really sure. Hmm. I don't think what, yeah, offhand, I don't know. Has anyone got it working seemingly so. correct that you know of, or no? Besides Mark. Besides Mark, of course. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why that would be. Um, like, in the, are the counts ending up the same-ish? Like, you're getting the similar counts, but it's like there's a physical... Yeah. Um, well, Mark suggested, like, the, you don't have the stereos protection on their uh, comparators. Okay, yeah, so it's a double. Yeah, uh, well, I'm not sure if that's the issue. Because, yeah, like, you, like, how it seems to work is we run code for one motor, and it go from the right speed or slightly faster. We run it for both, and they both be going a slower speed, <coughs> even though they should be going under the same speed of description. Oh, so when you turn on the other, yeah, that, and, Part of this might be, um, I know there was issues with the lockout. Um, uh, something you might try is to take, like when you have your motors, um, power, like use a completely separate power supply for your motor driver boards as your law, everything else, like the logic and stuff. Uh, have you tried that yet or has it always been, because it's possible that it's locking out um, or wire it right to the batteries. Even those power supplies, the problem is when the motors, uh, like they can demand really high spikes of current that you know you can't, you don't see in the, the current demand, so it looks like you're okay. Yeah. Uh, but that board is pretty sensitive to locking. The other thing you can see is if you can get from Mark, uh, I don't know if they have larger electrolytic capacitors, but uh, basically right on the motor driver board, so you have the V plus here. And I'll ask Mark out of interest, uh, so there's the V plus and the minus, basically soldering at this point uh, a fairly large capacitor. Uh, the reason being that what this will do is it'll allow, when the motor demands high current, it's going to come right from this capacitor rather than having to go through the wiring to the battery. 
Uh, in your kits, they don't give you any large capacitors. They only give you like 10 microfarads, I think, or something. Uh, I'll see out of interest if they have any, because that's sort of something you might need, I have a suspicion. Uh, because if it's slowing down, to me, that really suggests the motor driver is locking out. And it might just be, you know, it can be for very, very short periods of time. Uh, so you might check the, the voltage. If you probe right here as well, to can see, you know, if it's really insanely noisy, that could be an issue. Uh, it could be, the EMI could be, because the motor's right beside that optical sensor, uh, it does generate quite a bit of EMI, even these little guys, and it could be coupling to the, those lines um, uh, that go to your AVR. And because the EMI is, you know, these really powerful spikes, it can easily generate um, interrupts like easily generate sort of very short spikes. So also probe, I would probe the signal going into the AVR with the motors running and just confirm it doesn't, you know, you don't see these really narrow spikes. Uh, the problem is the AVR will interrupt on like, you know, a 10 nanosecond or shorter pulse, very, very short pulse. Um, the other thing you could do that might help that a bit as a test, a really easy test is that, um, so you have your, I mean, very basically, you know, this is sort of the, I assume this is sort of the circuit you're using and then this goes to the AVR type thing. So like if this is the photo transistor on the encoder, is that? It goes to the comparator. You see, oh, you use an external comparator. Okay, yeah, so that's like, that's better. Um, so what you can do basically is that if you put a small capacitor here, uh, to ground, and I don't know what values you had. You could either calculate it or play around a bit. Uh, but what's going to happen is that this resistor and this capacitor uh, will form a little bit of a low-pass filter. Um, and what's going to happen is that if you have EMI on this line, and put that capacitor closer to the op amp, uh, if you have you know these EMI spikes that are low energy but very narrow, they should be uh, sort of blocked out by that capacitor. Um, and what you can actually do, what might be even a little better, is if you do something like, this, um, where so I've added a series resistor, and so here I'm explicitly making a low-pass filter. So you can try just the capacitor. Um, and so, you know, this resistor is, is this like 2K or 4K or something? Whatever value you've used, vaguely in that area. I don't know, it's probably like, you know, 1 to 10K in there. Um, so this series resistor, um, you don't want to be too large. You could try 1K. You might need to go with like three, 330 ohms. Uh, you can play around a bit. You, you know, you can either calculate what the, uh, the cutoff frequency is. You know, you, you know how fast the, the frequency coming out of that wheel needs to be approximately like 10 hertz probably or 100 hertz. I can't imagine much higher than that. Uh, so you can have a pretty low cutoff frequency. So this capacitor, I'm sure, could easily be the 100 nanofarad one um, without issue. Uh, so what you're doing here is you're going to be rounding off that waveform you get, uh, and you'll have a much nicer input to the comparator now. And you'll also be eliminating any, if there are EMI spikes, you'll be getting rid of that completely. Um, so I would suspect, it could be a combination of the two, but uh, because these circuits can actually be so fast, um, I would suspect you may be getting sort of double multiple counts more than you expect. And it sounds like combined with some issue with the motor driver lockout, uh, it's hard to differentiate the two because they interplay. But I would look there. Uh, and the other thing to make sure is that um, on the power pins of this device, you're normally supposed to provide decoupling. Uh, so if you don't have that, that can be an issue. So there should be a capacitor, this, that 100 nanofarad. I really should just use the whiteboard compared to um, that 100 nanofarad capacitor to ground. So if this is V plus, 
Uh, and that helps eliminate, if there's transients in the power supply, that'll drastically affect your comparator. So having a decoupling capacitor, they call it, as close as possible to the device uh, could also help with issues. So you, know, you could just try all of them at once and see. Uh, basically, with, with the low-pass filter, I would just verify with the scope that you know, you're getting the expected waveform. Like, you, you really want to see uh, almost a more rounded waveform and you know, no spikes in it. Um, hopefully that's enough to, to increase, reduce the issues, but um, I'm going to try, so I, the, on Monday, the lab, I'm not here, but I'll ask the Aaron and Kyle, hopefully Kyle's been out sick, so I, he should be back, hopefully, uh, to be in the lab for that time, um, and otherwise I'm going to try to s set up another time during the week that they can just be in C102. Um, so if you have issues like this, that they can at least help you a bit. Uh, as always, you can see Mark. That also reminds me, so on Thursday, your classes, um, all, all the classes are canceled officially, so you have no classes to worry about. You probably assumed that, but uh, your instructor, if they want to reschedule, they'll let you know. Uh, they may use this time on, or they may use the Monday time slot or something like that. It's sort of up to them. Uh, I gave them that option, but I, at least Dr. Slagle was just going to cancel, and I think maybe Farid was going to use it. He wasn't sure, but it sounded like people were ahead of schedule, we so. Him Pardon? We shut him down. Oh, okay. He, yeah, him. yeah, really? Okay. <laughs> so he's not going to use it. Uh, yeah, so he should be fine then. Uh, that, he was the only one that potentially was, and around, I think, said he wasn't. Yeah. So they, they would have told you, it sounds like, so. But yeah, so does that kind of give you something to try? Any other questions or other issues? So if not, I'm leaving right after this to the airport, so I won't be around for office hours. Um, and I'll be back Thursday. You can email me. Uh, also, if you have issues, if you use the bulletin board, the TAs can see it as well. Um, and Kyle and Aaron might be faster in responding. I'll be online, but it'll be a lot more sporadic over the next week, um, but yeah, so that's it. Kind of good luck, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll see you in one week with Working Robots. And there, there is, by the way, I'd sent out an announcement. If you want to have a special team name, there's an online test. I'm pretty sure it'll work. I have never used the Blackboard Learn uh, test submission. Oh, I'm not logged in, okay. But it, uh, it lets you submit who are your team members and what's your team name. So that team name will just be displayed on the competition day. Uh, you might be able to enter one day up. I don't guarantee that. So if you have a really cool team name that you want you know, for everyone to know and revel in, be sure to submit that using the online test. Uh, it's written as a test, by the way. So I think it gives you a mark, but ignore that. It's, yeah, it was the easiest way to get data from people. So that's it.